Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Sunley from CTWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. This session, I'm going to discuss with you about hazard communication and the requirements that OSHA has, as it's laid out within the 29 CFR, the 1910 General Industry Standard, and the 1926 Construction Industry Standard, as it pertains to employers making sure that you're aware of any kind of hazards you might be exposed to while working on a job site. Some of the main components that we're going to discuss during this module will be the five different elements that OSHA has established that are required to be part of the HAZCOM program that employers have. We're also going to go through some of the different rights you have under the HAZCOM standard. We'll also identify the different required components of labels and what all the different labeling symbols mean. And also, we're going to finish up then with the importance of handling any hazardous material. And if you are being exposed to any hazardous material, what the potential for you being exposed to that material could do to you physically and, and the emergency procedures needed and necessary if you do get exposed to some chemicals. Now, within HAZMAT, or HAZCOM, I'm sorry, they, they are looking at you having the right to understand what you're being exposed to, whatever kind of chemicals, whatever kind of hazard. All of us on job sites will end up being exposed to some type of chemical, and you must be protected from that exposure. As you're out and about doing anything on a job site, this course does not qualify or train you in order to clean up any spills or any kind of uh, chemical release. That is a totally separate and different 40 hour hazmat class. But this course does give you an idea that there's going to be someone that needs to come in and do that, that's going to be trained above and beyond your capabilities or your experience until you've attended and taken that 40 hour class. What this course tries to reinforce is what your employers must do for you and what you must experience. There's no way that we can teach you about the specific chemicals that you will be exposed to on a job site. Your employers need to run through all of the different things that you'll be working in and around, all the chemicals you'll be exposed to, and what they want you to do and what's required for them to have you do to stay safe while you're working in these different environments. Now, with the HAZCOM training, that's going to, we're going to prepare you or give you an idea of where you can go to find out information about the chemicals you, that you're working with or that you're working around. There's going to be labeling requirements like the picture on the left. There's going to then be SDSs, safety data sheets, that have to be provided and available for you. There's all kinds of information that can be found on the Internet. NIOSH has a hazardous chemical guide that you can both get a hard copy of, and they've got a wonderful app for that NIOSH hazard guide. So there are many, many resources and many ways of getting information and to get a better idea of what you need to do to protect yourself from any kind of chemicals on any kind of job site, any kind of activity that you might be doing on a job site itself. Now, as you're working, if something does spill, this training or this class is going to get you to understand that there's things you need to do when it still happens. Can you automatically jump in and clean it up? Do you have the capability? Do you have the supplies to clean it up? How much chemical has spilled? Do we need to report that chemical or that spillage? There are certain chemicals that, based on the type of chemical it is, you actually have to report to the state and different regulatory agencies a spillage and cleanup of chemicals. But that's then going to be done, those cleanups will be then done by a qualified response team or someone who's got the actual training and the equipment and the supplies to do that kind of a cleanup. Now here's the first activity. Hopefully you've downloaded then your handouts that go along with this class. And now I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to go through and answer these questions or look at these questions in a true and false um, format and decide whether you need to think that statement is true or whether you think that statement is false. So I'll come back at you here in about 30 seconds.
All right, we should be hopefully done with your your uh, choices on the true and false. So the first one, the OSHA standard, the standard requires all employers to provide workers with information about the hazardous chemicals in which they are exposed. That is true. They have to tell you. They have to give you that information. B, employers are required to provide workers with a safety data sheet, SDAS, within a work shift in which it is requested, if you request one. This is also true. Realistically, most employers are going to go out of their way to train you and show you the SDS is on the chemicals you're working around before you then get on a shift. So we'll document that, and that will be part of the training component that we'll talk about here in a little while. C, chemical importers, manufacturers, and distributors initiated the OSHA hazard communication standard because they were concerned about liability. That is false. Uh, they are required to then put together the labeling and do the FDSs, but they did not initiate or force or then pressure OSHA to put together this HAZCOM standard. We'll talk a little bit about the history here in just a little bit. Employers are required to provide annual training in hazard communication. This is also false. They have to provide you initial training, and then they have to provide you any kind of training on new chemicals and new things you're going to be exposed to. But there's not the annual requirement. All right, good. Hopefully everyone did, did activity one all right. Let's jump into activity number two. You have possible answers over on the, on the right-hand side of, this, of the screen and also on your sheet that's on the, the left-hand side. Those possible answers, those numbers, can be used more than once if you then think you need to use them. But if you would, put your idea or the number you think is then correct and appropriate for the statement by each statement. I'll uh, stop talking and give you guys, uh, and again, another 30 seconds to go ahead and, and do this one. All right, that's right at about 30 seconds. So with the first statement, workers die each year from occupational injuries. How many do you think die each year? And that's not basically from injuries sustained during that year. This is then from injuries from previous years. So what did everyone guess on that one? Or what did everyone take? If you then took B, 5,000, you got it correct. Approximately 5,000 die from occupational injuries. All right, how many workers do you think die each year from occupational diseases that were caused by chemical exposures during their career? E, greater than or more than 50,000 workers die throughout the world because of chemical exposures. The next one, chemical specific standards. Which of the chemical specific standards or how many chemical specific standards does OSHA actually enforce? That's A, 500 of them. 500 different standards are out there for the different chemicals and the things that you could be exposed to. And last but not least, chemical products used in the workplace. How many do you think are used throughout the world? Over 50,000 significant number. When you're then thinking about that volume, that amount of exposure throughout the world, and then as we're focusing on our workers here in the United States, we then really have to be concerned with either exposures and overall safety. And you will hear it constantly through your careers about being as safe as possible. Right now, currently, they say we average per day four construction workers dying on the job. Here you can see this scissor lift that's fallen over onto the road. And it looks like he then rolled that the scissor lift up over some material while it was extended up. But unfortunately, someone paid the price for doing something in a little bit quicker fashion and probably not the way he was trained, he or she, let me rephrase that, how they were then trained 
to then actually move that scissor lift. Now this, this drawing or this uh, map of the United States represents the amount of deaths that were attributed to construction jobs in 2018, as is tracked by both CPWR and by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. This is just 2018. And basically, this just represents the fatalities between January and June of 2018. There were 319 pins, if you want to count them all there on that, that map, 319 pins that are in that map. In 2017, there was a grand total of 685 fatalities on construction sites. In 2016, there were 715 fatalities. Sad part about this, over a third of the fatalities that occurred in all of these different situations in all these different years, a third of them are all attributed then to falls. Falls is the most common type of injury or cause and reason for fatality on construction sites. Any of the classes you take, you'll hear that over and over again. Now, as we then, as I pointed out earlier, you know, kind of why did we have a HAZCOM standard? Why was it put together? Just a little bit of a history on it. It's kind of a bizarre thing from, from back in 1952 and actually then again in 1969, the river in Cleveland caught fire. Think about that one. The river in Cleveland, Ohio caught fire. As you look at this image, you can see the debris, the material coming down off of that side. Um, I don't know if you call it drainage ditch or some type of drainage uh, causeway, but the river itself caught fire. This prompted the United States government to establish and create both the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and to start coming up with some kind of guideline for protecting people. This actually started a fire all along the, the waterfront of Cleveland and decimated the, the actual waterfront in Cleveland. And the big driving force for creating and implementing the HAZCOM OSHA standard nationally is this incident that happened in California, where in 1977, there were 60 workers that were working in a chemical plant, making, mixing up, and putting together pesticide where they then tested and ended up being sterile. 60 workers going in day in, day out, trying to earn a living and ended up being sterile for the, the actual environments that they're working in. So California passed their own law. That was considered the right to know. They established that requirement and OSHA jumped on it and agreed that that's something that they needed to implement nationally. And in 1983, federal OSHA implemented the Hazardous has Communication, the HAZCOM standard, and it, it was known for a long time, guys, as that right to know. It was because of those 60 individuals, unfortunately, that had that exposure and paid the ultimate price of, of becoming sterile because of, of going to work. So now for activity three, the third one I, I would like you to do there on your handout. What I want you to do is for you guys just to think on your own and um, on your, your handout, uh, just kind of come up with some of the ideas or what, are, what you think or why you think that the HASCOM standard would be important for you, the workers, for anyone at all. So I'll give you another 30 seconds and we'll, we'll come back and, and kind of share some ideas here. All right, hopefully you then got some good ideas down and some, some ideas that, uh, that gives you an idea as to why uh, the HAZCOM standard is important. But if you stop and really look at it and think about it, 32 million workers 
have the potential of being exposed to chemicals. That's according to OSHA in just the United States. Just the United States. And then according to the International Labor Organization, which is again part of the, the, uh, uh, the United Nations, they say roughly one quarter of the workplaces throughout the world, the diseases and injuries that are caused in those environments are caused by chemicals. So the main focus for the longest time with HAZCOM has always been on chemicals and the exposure to chemicals. And so as we go through this, you have multiple hazards that you could be in and around, but the main focus usually in a HAZCOM situation is on your chemical exposure. And with the HAZCOM standard, over the years, it's evolved. Uh, HAZCOM, you hear me using that acronym. Some individuals like to just call it HCS for the HAZCOM standard. Like I said, it started off with the right to know. It has evolved now to right to understand. With the new programs and new international global understanding of chemicals and chemical exposures, that's the actual term that, that uh, is being used globally is the right to understand. And like I made the comments earlier, we have both the general industry, the 1910 standard, and the construction standard, the 1926. And the 1926 refers right back to the 1910 as to the HAZCOM requirements, the hazard communication requirements. So that is our main focus is that 1910-1200. As you look to the right on that lovely little uh, barrel, do you think that's the right place then to be storing a phone? Luckily, it's not an old rotary dial phone, but it is still a phone. If you look at the labeling on that drum, you'll see that it's labeled as an oxidizer. An oxidizer can both burn and support combustion. If there's any kind of spark from that phone that would ignite the fumes for that oxidizer, that would not be fun. Uh, the fire that would spread throughout that area would be significant. Again, it can both burn and support co combustion. Oxidizers are something of significant uh, concern if you're working in around and storing. With the, the, the evolving, if you will, of the HAZCOM standard, the GHS, the Global Harmonization System, came into effect in 2012. This is then implemented through the United Nations, and this is then a worldwide or a global standard for hazard communication. This then establishes the requirements that we're gonna be talking about here with the different classifications, the establishing of the readable and functioning safety data sheets. And it also then gives a, a standardized way of labeling chemicals. No matter where the chemicals are made throughout the world, they now have a standardized labeling procedure for those different chemicals. And the UN put, the, put out that, that purple book and provided that as a way of sending the information out throughout the world to make sure everyone's on board with this new way of looking at, identifying, and sharing then the risks of these different chemicals as they're created throughout the world. This, this kind of graphically shows you at the very top why the GHS was created. The symbols at the top is the way that a hazardous, poisonous, toxic chemical would or could have been labeled throughout the world prior to the GHS being created. No matter where the chemical was made, they would put whatever type of label or whatever type of symbol they wanted onto those different containers, those drums, those boxes. But at the bottom, now with the new GHS, they have gone to a consistency so that no matter where a chemical is manufactured, if it's manufactured in, in India and shipped to Spain or to Russia or to Japan, it's gonna have the, the labels on that are appropriate no matter where that chemical is going. It will have that symbol on there. It will have one label that's in, in, uh, in English and then one label that would be appropriate for whatever language that chemical is being shipped to. And it would, be, it would be language appropriate then labeling that goes along with a consistent English language. But that's with that new GHS system and how it's been implemented and then it's actually then changed in the HAZCOM standard. 
within the HASCOM standard, those five key elements that I talked about earlier that your employers have to have in place. And we're gonna then touch on all five of these, that your employers have to have a written program, that the containers that you then are using have to be labeled and have to be in a consistent format and have certain information on those labels. The safety data sheets must be available for any of the substances that you're then working with on the job site. You, the workers, the individuals that are on the job site must be trained on the HASCOM program and on the chemicals you're working in around. Can we just give you a chemical and say, here, use this, or do we need to make sure you have the eye protection, the gloves, and everything else that is appropriate for that chemical. And last but not least is then the employers must have an updated and accurate chemical inventory for all the chemicals they use within the company and all the chemicals that could be used on your job site. That is a required component of the HASCOM program. But with the very first component, they have to have, if you will, a written program in place. It lists all of those different chemicals all of the chemicals present on the job site. It has a method then that the employer has established to make sure that you guys have been informed and understand what you're working in and around and where the SDSs are in case you need to then review or look at the SDSs. You also have to have a method to inform you guys, the employees, the union workers, of the hazard of any of the types of jobs that might not be your routine task. If it's something different and out of the ordinary, they have to make sure that they document and inform everybody of any of those kind of special applications. And also the employer must provide to other employers on that job site what type of chemicals and their, their access to their SDSs because on those multiple employer job sites, what's the chance and possibility that a cleaning solvent that you might be using might react to some type of chemical I'm using as an adhesive for something I'm doing on the job site. Think of all the different trades that could be on a job site and the potential for, chem from, for chemicals to not be compatible is significant. So all of these parts and pieces have to be within that HAZCOM program. With, within that program also, you guys, you then have the right to review that program if you so desire. You also have the right to receive any and all information about the substances you're working around. You can get copies of it, you can ask. It's within your rights to ask for that. You have the right to get that information to provide to any physician or any kind of medical professional you go to see, or if you wanna share it with your union rep. And you also have the, the right to then do all of these things, ask for this information, gather all of this, these different types of, of items, and not then be punished or fired for asking or requesting those things. Those are all within your rights. Those are all things that, in OSHA's eyes, you have to then be informed and have to be protected, and the employer has to make sure that that stuff is available to you. The second of the five and pieces of the HASCOM program labels. And with the labels, all the different products are having these different parts and pieces or elements that must be part of the label. The signal words, the hazard statements, the pictograms, any precautionary statements, they all have to be in place. And with, with the labels, there is also then information as to who actually produced or made or manufactured that product. They have to have product identifier, have to have contact information. Um, supplier, you might have had a product that was made over in India, but then it is then manufactured in India, but is then shipped over and distributed and supplied through another organization or even relabeled in the United States. So there's that information that must be part of it. And any and all supplemental information that's necessary or appropriate based on the chemical, based on the potential hazard, based on what information the manufacturers are required to put on the label. Now, one of the key things that's a, a part of the label is then a signal word. For you, does it make a difference if a chemical is, is a danger or poses a danger to you, or if you just need to be warned about the chemical? What is the potential for you to have a real bad day 
with that slight difference between either danger or warning. And there is a difference. So those signal words, whatever is appropriate for that chemical, must be on the side or part of that label. You also have to have on precautionary statements. The label then is going to identify whether or not you need to do something special to then prevent, mitigate, or eliminate the possibility of an injury or an accident happening. These are just some examples of, of items that could be on the precautionary statements. There's also stuff that's good to know. There are chemicals out in the workplace that after they've been taken out of a cool, refrigerated environment, they could actually start on fire once they warm up to a certain temperature. There are chemicals out there that all you have to do is expose them to air and the chemical can explode or start on fire. It's nice to know that information. So that's what the intent of these precautionary statements are, is to give that basic fundamental information, a heads up, if you will, to individuals before they use different chemicals. Now here's then activity number four. We're going to then take a, about a minute or so to, to go through and do activity four, and that should then be on your handout. So if you would, match up the pictogram that's over on the left-hand side of your page with then the corresponding hazard identifier that's over on the right-hand side. So I'll be quiet for a little while and give you guys about a minute to go through and, uh, and look at and, and put together <clears throat> and your answers to what these pictograms actually mean. That's the hardest thing for an instructor, being quiet that long and not then uh, talking about something. So hopefully you guys have, uh, have your, your choices or your selections uh, done. These are the nine different mandatory uh, pictograms that would be used in the labels or on the labels, if you will, as the manufacturers are putting together uh, the labels and how their chemicals would correspondingly need to have these easy visual reference emergency warnings uh, provided on the label. So let's start with uh, the first one up there in the top left-hand corner, the, the one that looks like the cherry bomb blowing up. Did everyone get that one down as an explosive? Yes, that one's pretty straightforward. The next one's pretty straightforward. Also, you'll notice that it's got the flame with the flame inside it. That then hopefully is, is one that everyone then picked as a flammable. Next to it, that was that symbol that was on the side of the drum that we looked at just a little while ago with the phone on top of the drum. That was an oxidizer. It would be nice to know if you're in and around an oxidizer. It's also nice to know if you're around something flammable. At what point, one temperature does it become flammable? The next symbol, that one's a pretty straightforward one. Gas is under pressure. High pressure tank, high pressure bottle. Uh, high pressure bottles have been known to explode, have had injuries associated to high pressure bottles. The next one, corrosive. Something either acidic or highly, highly on the base side that could then cause serious tissue damage. It could cause tissue damage on us. Um, it could cause damage then to different surfaces that it gets on, depending on the type of surface. Um, but corrosive is another significant potential hazard. Gotta love the Jolly Roger, the skull and crossbones. That's something that has an acute toxicity, highly poisonous. The next one that looks like the human body, that is a health hazard, a known health hazard. That chemical or that component that that label is on uh, poses then a health risk. 
It might be a known carcinogen or cancer-causing chemical. It might be that it's a mutagen. It actually then can mutate cells, uh, but it then do does cause significant damage to our health, and people need to be aware of and, and if you will, protected from it. The exclamation point. I thought this one was interesting. They use that to then identify an irritant. An irritant, anything that causes any kind of discomfort to your skin, to your dermis. How about if you're breathing something and all of a sudden you have some coughing or you have some serious uh, reddening of your throat or you have a burning sensation in your throat? There are chemicals out there that are irritants. And the thing about it is that some things will irritate some individuals, some things won't bother other individuals at all. All of us have our own susceptibility to things that fall into that category. And the ninth pictogram, which is the only one of the nine that is non-mandatory. This, this pictogram does not have to be on a label. A manufacturer could put, them on, put this symbol on if they wanted to, but it is not mandatory. And this is the one that's the environmental pollutant. This is then an identifier that this chemical or this product could damage our environment. But again, it's non-mandatory. So those are the nine different pictograms. As you look at the nine different pictograms of those nine, five of them are actually physical hazards. The explosives, the flammable, the oxidizers, the gas, the corrosives, those are physical hazards, could pose a physical hazard to us. The other three are health hazards. Acute toxicity, the highly poison, the health hazard, the irritant. So that's kind of, if you will, a breakdown of those pictograms and how those pictograms could or would be used on the side of your labels. Now, look at these two individuals. As you look at the warning, the, the cautionary statements, and the pictograms, those are the actual items that are off that bag that she's pouring into that five-gallon drum. And if anyone in here has ever mixed up a joint compound, you know that guy is getting ready to pull the trigger on his drill and mix up and agitate the compound with the water so they get that nice moist compound to spread on the drywall surface. Now, do you think either one of them are in any way following then the label? Is the label effectively telling these guys that, hey, you need to have some skin or some eye protection. And you know as soon as he pulls that trigger, how big of a cloud is coming right up out of the bottom of that five-gallon drum or that five-gallon bucket as he then tries to mix up that product. Now, the labels can be there. Paying attention to them, that's the key. Understanding what you're being exposed to. As you're using chemicals, and there's all kinds of different chemicals you could potentially use on a job site. You then have them in their original containers, that's great. The labels are on them, the labels are in place. The container to the right, you can see with the blue top on it, that has got some chemical or something that was added to it. Now, as long as you're controlling that, as long as you're taking that and just transferring that from, say, five-gallon drum over to the, whatever item or whatever piece of equipment you're using that in, that's fine, as long as it's for transfer. But if you're storing, anything in there, or if you're going to leave it for any length of time and it's not going to be in your control, you can't use that container unless you've got a label on it. So any of those, any of those types of can canisters or containers need to be labeled appropriately, just, as, just the same as the containers or the, the devices that the chemicals are delivered in from the manufacturer. Now, the third chunk and piece of the HAZCOM standard are the safety data sheets. SDSs. The nice thing about the safety data sheets, they have now been divided up into a format that is so easy to find the information. It has 16 different sections that are dedicated to certain topics. Identification information about the chemical. The actual hazard identification. Why or what is hazardous about that chemical itself? You also then are going to get information about the ingredients, the composition. This call could also be used and utilized in an emergency situation by the medical staff who's treating someone to know what is actually in the chemicals that have somehow gotten into you or into an individual. Any first aid measures that you would take either for yourself or for any of your coworkers on the job site, that would be listed 
there in Section 4 of the SDS. Firefighting measures, can you always use um, a type A fire extinguisher to put out the fire? Certain chemicals might have different requirements for firefighting measures. You also then have on the SDS what you should do if you have an accidental release or spillage of that chemical. Or what you can do in an emergency situation. How about for the handling and storage? What can it be stored with? Where can it be stored? Does it need certain temperature? Does it have certain specialty requirements? If you're being exposed to it, what are the PPE or the personal protective equipment that you, the end user of that product, need to address and need to make sure of as you're then applying that product to whatever surface or to whatever spot you're using it on a job site? Now, the other eight items on here, you have you have a couple of them that are non-mandatory, but there are still some sections such as the physical and chemical properties of that chemical that need to then be accomplished. It has to be on that, that FDS. You also need to have on there the stability and reactivity. How stable and what will that chemical actually react with? Is temperature a concern? Is, is there anything that uh, could it be affected by exposure to water or exposure to air? All those things would be in that section 10. Toxicology, there's gonna be a separate section that we're gonna then provide for you guys that's gonna be on toxicology. And the toxicological information is then how, if you get exposed to this chemical, it's gonna affect your body. And so we'll then discuss that in another module about toxicology. And then the sections that are not mandatory that have a little bit more that are, are focusing on the ecology um, are then the next few sections. So the ecological information, how you dispose of, how you'd get rid of, what's the proper technique or the requirements for disposal of the chemical if you need to dispose of it. Transportation information. If you then have a CDL, commercial driver's license, can you then transport this chemical? Does it require a hazmat certification or a, have that endorsement on your CDL license? Those are all, all items that would be listed the DOT requirements, the Department of Transportation, the placard on the side of the truck or the trailer or the, the actual uh, railroad car that is then transporting the chemicals would all be in that section. And then any pertinent regulatory information that would be added to or part of the SDS has got its own separate section. And the 16th and final section is kind of a be all cover all other information, anything else that the manufacturer thinks that you guys should know or things that should be shared um, with you before you start using the product. So the 16 different mandatory, and these SDSs are so much easier now to use and to find information that when you get a new chemical or if you get something new, how is it gonna impact you? What's it gonna do? Is it gonna bother you? Is it something you can use on the job site? Is it gonna be compatible with something else you're using on the job site? And the employer, when they then bring in any kind of new chemical, has to then make sure they provide you with that new SDS, or if there's any change to the chemical you're using, if there's a change then to the chemical, they have to send a new revised SDS and share that with you. You gotta be informed of before you start using the next chemical. They have gotta post it, have it available on the job site. And as you look at this job site, where would they then keep an SDS on a job site? You can see the job trailers. You can see the pickup trucks. How many different companies, how many different trades do we have working on this job site? Think about all the possible different SDS locations on this site. What do you think is the most commonly missed question when an OSHA investigator comes onto a job site? Their most commonly missed question? Where are the SDSs on the job site? It is their number one missed question when they come on and they do a visit. So knowing where the, the, the chemicals are, how they're treated, how they're taken care of, knowing where you can get access to the SDS, knowing what you're exposed to, knowing what you have to wear to protect yourself is all huge. But then if OSHA does come on site, that is one of the questions they will ask. Where are they at? Now the fourth chunk or piece of the HASCOM program the employers have to make sure they've implemented and they have, have accomplished with their employees is the training component. Within that, that training, they gotta make sure they run through and discuss their, their HASCOM program, the standard itself, 
They have to then go through how and when you're using the different hazardous substances. You might have hazardous chemicals that the company uses but it's not on your job site, but there could be coworkers in and around you that have those chemicals or those exposures. What's the chance of possibly if you bring your clothes back or there's clothes being stored in the same location, you might have chemicals on clothes that could react with each other. And the other big, huge component of the training is then all of the different, both the physical and the chemical and the nature and, and what the actual hazards that are posed by all of the things you could be exposed to on any kind of a job site. They have to do this training. They've got to document that all that training has been accomplished. They've got to share all of that information. You, the workers, have to make sure that, that you understand and have been trained on and they, they make it aware to you how they're going to detect the presence of these different substances, the monitoring that's going on, what protective measures, what kind of PPE, where are we then keeping then the HAZCOM program? Is it on the job site? Do we have it online? Yes, yes, as you can see the actual um, SDS books down there in the lower right-hand corner. That's fairly common what the actual SDS uh, booklets or three-ring binders look like, but those have to be then displayed prominently. They have to tell you where those are. And the other thing too is they then have to make sure that you guys all understand your rights and you understand then the labeling system. That's all stuff that's got to be documented. They've got to then talk about as part of that training component of the HASCOM standards. Now, the fifth and final piece, if you will, of that HASCOM standard is the chemical inventory. If you think about it, we talked about the written program. We talked about the labels. We talked about the SDSs. We just, we just discussed the training. That's all part of the HASCOM. But the chemical inventory, everything else ends up coming off the chemical inventory. What we're going to have to have for SDS is what we have to be trained on, what labels are going to be there. The program is going to be based on the chemicals that we use within the company. So the chemical inventory is huge. The nice thing about some of the different programs that are out there now on the website or on, online, if you will, they actually have a way to, to create and keep and capture SDSs online so that a company doesn't have to have the hard copies. They can actually have an electronic record of their SDSs as long as they provide you access. They give you access that if you want to, you can go in and see those SDSs, but they can do that storage of the safety data sheets online. The nice thing about it, it automatically creates for the contractor or the employer that chemical inventory. It's all in one spot. So there's more companies that are going that direction that are doing that online record keeping or documentation and the retention of the SDSs. And with some of the different programs, all they have to do is go in and search for a chemical, pick out the chemical they want and add it to their folder or add it to their program and boom, that stuff's all being created for them. You're seeing quite a few companies that are going that direction with the, the keeping and retain, the retention of the SDS is online. So take a second here and just think on your own. Think of the different hazards. And I've, I've kind of thrown some of them out at you guys. Um, physical and chemical. The HASCOM program, the employer wants to, needs to, is required to make sure you're protected from any hazards you're going to be exposed to on a job site. When we break this down, both physical and chemical, some of the physical hazards. Stop and think about it. Here's where wearing hard hats, wearing gloves, wearing steel-toed shoes, wearing hearing protection, wearing any kind of, of uh, flotation device in and around water, even down to the point of wearing respirators for any kind of dust and fibers that might be in and around you. Physical hazards. Now, on the chemical side, are you guys exposed to any of these potential chemicals on a job site all the time? And an employer, again, has to protect you from the hazards. Whatever you might be exposed to, they've got to make sure and protect you from those hazards, be it physical, be it chemical. If you do get exposed to any of those hazards, is there a chance and possibility that emergency, emergency services or first aid might need to be implemented? It depends on what you're being exposed to. It depends on what the injury was. 
But the, the nice thing about the SDS is it tells you what you need to do for first aid and what needs to be done if you get exposed to them, the chemicals, for some of the physical hazards, that's just going to be your basic first aid CPR. Hopefully, most of you guys have taken a CPR first aid class somewhere. That is also a great thing to have knowledge of on a job site. But anytime you're on a job site, understanding what you're being exposed to, understanding then what you need to do if, for any reason, first aid is necessary or needed is then huge. This has come training. If you have a spill, if there is a leak, if there is something that is, that is a liquid or a contaminant that's in and around where you're working, this is not training you need to clean it up. Remember that. I made that statement at the beginning of this. this is, that's going to then be for those emergency responders, those people that have that training. But you need to make sure you inform your supervisor. Make sure you tell your coworkers. Make sure someone doesn't go, go through the spill. Um, you want to get away from but make sure everyone else gets away from it. And make sure you then are following the HAZCOM program from your employer and their spill response program that's going to be part of that to then get that spill taken care of and handled. If you guys have a fire, you then should be trained on the use of firefighting equipment. You have to be comfortable with it. Make sure you have the right extinguisher. Make sure you always have a way out. Do not ever get yourself in a situation where there is a hard way or a difficult way for you to get from where that fire is out to where it's nice, clean air, and into a safe environment. A lot of companies then will give you training so you can learn the different types of techniques for the use of, of fire extinguishers. For anyone that's done any kind of fire extinguisher training, the acronym that sticks with you, that will be with you for forever, is PATH. That acronym has been established and in place for a long time. You're talking about pass. Pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle or the trigger of the extinguisher, and it's sweeping back and forth on the, the base of that fire. Not up in the flames, but at the base. But any kind of time you're around, realize there are some chemicals out there also, you guys, that actually chemicals, if they come in contact with each other, could start a fire, spontaneous combustion. You could have a chemical on a surface and another chemical being spilled onto a contaminated surface and then have that kind of reaction. So you just have to be care conscious of, be careful of the use of the chemicals and know where you've got the extinguishers if you need to utilize them for any kind of situation where a fire does occur. So as we've gone through this, as we've discussed this, the different chemicals, if for any reason you have gotten exposed to a chemical, you got to make sure you then tell someone. You got to tell your supervisor, tell your employer, uh, if need be. You know, even get your union involved, your union rep. You should have a an actual uh, union steward on your job that you can then talk with, and make sure they're aware of what's going on. You would need to identify the chemicals. You would need to make sure that if you if this, this does progress into an emergency situation, that the hospital is aware of the chemicals you're exposed to. So, so they can properly treat you or take care of you in that emergency hospital situation. SDSs are huge. Follow the directions for the first aid requirements or directions that are on the SDS. Reviewing the safety data sheet before you use a chemical is going to be one of your best procedures, one of your, your best, best activities that you can then do. It doesn't hurt to take the time to look at the SDSs, and in the long run, it's going to be to your advantage. And if you do get exposed to a chemical, make sure you find a way of getting medical attention. Get the medical attention you need. If you're not feeling right, if something doesn't feel right, don't just go home and say, oh, I'll just go home and get a nap. There are, there are certain things and certain chemicals that can start and then it can escalate. So don't hesitate on getting the medical attention you need so that you're properly protected and you're properly taken care of in those situations where you might have had an exposure. CPWR is here for you. If you have any comments, any questions, if you have any issues, if there's anything we can help you with, we have both our phone number that's here on the screen that I'll give you guys a chance here to, to, to write the phone number down. We also have our website. Our CPWR.com website is maintained by some wonderful people within our organization, and it's a 
a virtual warehouse of safety information on any kind of topic you can imagine. So I would then, if I were you, I would have that as one of my saved items on my, um, my website, uh, preferred favorite website, and have it as a resource. If you want to, you can also sign up and get CPWR's newsletter, which we send out different types of topics, information, updates about safety issues, safety items, and things that are happening that can be brought to your attention. And it doesn't hurt to have multiple sources of information, but we're here for you. Any, any questions you have, give us a call. If you have any issues, give us a call. Anything we can do to help you, we're here to help any, any and all members of all the unions to maintain a safe environment and understand how important it is to ask questions and to pose the questions before you do anything that just doesn't seem quite right. Take care, be safe, and best of luck to you in your careers.